take a quick look here, see how many interesting looks I'm receiving for the title of this sermon. Oh, now people are actually taking a look at it. Okay. <laughs> yes, that's one way to get people to look at your slide up on the screen is point it out and see what happens. Uh, of course, uh, today being Mother's Day, this first day of not this first this first day of the week, and and Mother's Day, uh, we do thank our mothers. We do appreciate them, and um, as a a way of kind of highlighting that is uh, saw an idea a little while back, and I put it on onto a side spot where I'd find it, and I actually found it again of a note where to an idea for today's lesson, and that is to highlight godly women. Uh, in this particular case, it looks more uh, directly at wives and the way that, and the relationship there. And so we're going to look at a few verses of what Peter has to say about this, and then we get into a single verse for the men to pay special attention to that reflects upon the women. So, in 1 Peter is where we're going to spend our time this morning. And Peter gives very practical advice of what kind of person we should be in our daily lives and why we should even be that way. Uh, even gives specific examples to different categories of people for uh, how to treat, you know, how to look at government, how to look at business, how, you know, in several aspects, including marriage. And that is one we're going to look at today. So men... Do we seek out the kind of wife that Peter talks about when, he, uh, when we look for a woman to be in our lives? Another question goes to the ladies is, do you seek out a man that will respect you for being that kind of godly woman? You know, unfortunately today, you know, and I'm very glad Peter wrote this in the way that he did. He said, wives, husbands. It is very pointed. God is very specific in what he wants in a marriage and for the ability for mothers and for the Mother's Day, for uh, all of these things. Unfortunately, the world we live today should not be too surprising. The more we study about, especially in the Old Testament and going through, we see the things that have happened time and time again is that we get away from God's plan. So it's great to be able to look at it and just refresh our memories about it and remember, what does God want from us? So before we get into the specifics of uh, the recipe for wives and looking at you know, how the wife is and how the husband should treat the wife, first off, we want to look at what does Peter tell everyone. If we go back to the very beginning of uh, 1 Peter chapter 1, he introduces this by saying, Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to the pilgrims of the dispersion in uh, Pontus, Galatia, Cappadonia, Asia, and Bithynia. Peter spends a lot of time in his letter focusing on the Jews that have now turned into Christians who have now been dispersed after the persecution. They were all concentrated in Jerusalem for the most part. Now they're spread out and all over. The great part about this letter is that he hits so many areas, but all of the things that he says are words of encouragement. He is trying to encourage, he is trying to lift up, and, be, and he does this by saying, to the starting back at verse 2, elect according to the foreknowledge of God the Father in sanctification of the Spirit for obedience and sprinkling of the blood of Jesus Christ. Grace to you and peace be multiplied. His goal and his idea and his hope for all people is that we have grace to us from God and peace through that grace, through the elect of being sanctified through uh, God, through the Son and his death. Yes, it was a tragic thing that had to happen, but yet so much good and great can come from it. As we look through, we see that there is a uh, encouraging tone about it is that you know, in this part here, he wants peace to be multiplied to us. Verse 4, he says that there's an inheritance uh, reserved in heaven. Verse 6, he says, in this, in all of what he has just said, greatly rejoice. Do we do that in our daily lives? Do we rejoice and take moments like today for Mother's Day? 
to rejoice in our mothers. Okay, maybe they had a stern hand on us at time, uh, from time to time, but I also believe that it was so that we might be able to grow appropriately. At least in my case, it was justified when it had happened, when she had to be stern with me, but I think in overall, she's done a good job. Peter also gives us some basics for all of us to live upon. When we go into chapter 2 and verse 11, he starts looking at this, and one word I keep seeing over and over is the word therefore. You know, it takes a little, you know, when I started looking at just the verses for today, and it kept saying therefore, and you go backwards, and you see a therefore, keep going backwards. This was one of the spots that I think is one of the uh, key points of uh, his letter here is in verse 11, he says, Beloved, I beg you as sojourners and pilgrims, abstain from fleshly lusts which war against the soul, having your conduct honorable among the Gentiles, that when they speak against you as evildoers, that they, by your good works which they observe, glorify God in the day of visitation. In all things that we do, we need to abstain from the things that are not good for us. Abstain from the fleshly lust which war against the soul. In such a world where you kind of do anything you want to do, do whatever makes you feel good, God says through the hand of Peter, abstain from worldly lusts, from fleshly things. Uh, let our conduct be honorable. Even if others may speak bad against us, even if we have that little grumbling against our mother about, you know, she took the whip to me or something, the question is why? Was it for the right reasons? And if so, then it brings glory to God because she's trying to rear us up in the right way. Let our actions speak louder than the words of deceit. But getting more closely into what we're looking at today as we look at chapter 3 and our focus for today Looking at three, uh, starting off with one through six, we look at the qualities of a godly wife. And as, as I read this, as I think about this, as we look at other passages, you know, Peter was married. And from some commentaries and some uh, things that look at it is that quite possibly his wife was with him during some of his ministry as he went to and fro. Uh, and so I wonder if she was standing here when he said this. I wonder if he thought about her when he wrote this. You know, as a husband, as an apostle, did he take and put her in this limelight? You know, we think about it, it also has the example of, uh, we'll see down in verse 6, Sarah and Abraham are an example. We're seeing that in our uh, Sunday morning Bible studies as well. We could look at Noah and his wife. We could look at any number of examples of women who are unnamed in the scriptures. Do, how are their husbands so successful at staying faithful to God and staying true? They are counted as righteous. It is possible for one to be righteous, one to be unrighteous, but it is a lot easier for them both to be righteous and hold each other up. So to give great credit to the wives is a very good thing to do because if we hold each other up, we go a lot further. So the qualities of a godly wife, verses 1 through 6, we start looking at the idea here is wives, likewise, be submissive to your own husbands, that even if some do not obey the word, that they, without a word, may be won by the conduct of their wives. You know, we get this idea of submissiveness. I like the way, you know, Adam uh, Miller at the gospel meeting that West President had, he brought out some great points about this, but really it goes all the way back to the Garden of Eden. It goes to the point of the men are supposed to be the leaders of the house, and even if the husband is not all there, on four wives, you married him. Must have been a reason. Maybe we can try, you know, if, if I'm lacking in some way, then my wife might be able to take and help bring me up even through just her conduct. It does no good to just fight one another and just keep on going against each other, but maybe through your influence you can have 
a focus there, but it is also to be submissive to the husband as the head of the household. It does not mean that it is weaker or inferior. It does not mean it is a struggle of strength, but it is a respect towards God. It shows that respect. It shows that focus. Every time Abram got up and said, oh, we're moving house again, honey, because I had another vision that night. Would she have answered and said, oh, I got to pack everything up again. I got to dust it off again. Where are we going this time? Or did she help her husband every time? You know, I think we have to look at that, you know, Noah saying, hey, we're going to go build an ark. A what? We're going to do all of this work so we can float on the water. What water? Oh, it's going to come down crazy. What have you been drinking? I don't think it went that way at all. You know, I think, you know, there may have been some questions. Okay, what are you talking about? Give me some more information, please. We know how you ladies are. You like information. I understand that. I get that, too. But look at the conduct of how they work together. We also see that as we continue forward, that the conduct of their wives, that um, verse 2, when they observe your chaste conduct accompanied by fear. As you continue with the process, a chaste woman, a woman should be for her husband and not the world. We start looking at how we dress ourselves here in a minute, but look at the conduct of this woman. Look at the world that they were just sent to. The Jewish nation, I don't think, had as much of this issue necessarily as the world around them that they are now involved in. Look at what Peter is writing to. He is writing to the dispersion, to those that are out in all of these heathen countries, these nations where just show yourself off, be with anyone, do whatever you want. But Peter says, be chaste in your conduct. Be for your husband. Don't go around allowing yourself with anything and everyone and all these things. Be focused. Show that focus to the world around by showing the, what we have one with another as husband and wife. And as we do that, he says, do not let your adornment be merely outward, arranging the hair, wearing gold, or putting on a fine apparel. Rather, let it be the hidden person of the heart with the incorruptible beauty of a gentle and quiet spirit, which is very precious in the sight of God. What do we choose to do with ourselves? And in this right here, he speaks primarily to the ladies, but don't worry, men, we're coming up next. How is the behavior to be? It is to be focused towards the husband, not to the entire world. Uh, it, it boggles the mind how you know, we have so loose morals around and how loosely we take and show off everything and then get offended so easily that someone's staring at it. I don't understand that out of our generations upcoming as they wear as little clothing as possible and then get offended when someone's looking at them. You're showing it off. It's like a Walmart rack. It's just there. You know, if you don't want to be the clothing rack at the store, put something on. Cover yourself up. And he says, don't let it be just merely apparel. It doesn't say you can't wear jewelry. It doesn't say you don't fix your hair. I actually think you should that it should. And he's not saying this here. Don't let your adornment be merely outward. Which means, why are we dressing ourselves up? Why are we looking nice? Is it to look our, to be able to say that I serve a God, I serve and care about myself, I care about my husband, I care about the image I present? Then absolutely, allow yourself to look the part. But is that the only reason we do all of this? Then we get into that issue. We get into the idea of what he says next in that verse 4 where it says, let it be the hidden person of the heart. 
Christ came bringing so many things about it's not just about checklists. It's not just about did I do this, did I not do this. A recipe says put this, this, this in, inside in these portions. It's funny how you know two people can make the same recipe, but one comes out excellent and great, and the other one doesn't. And you know, you kind of go back to the old thing: is well, this one was made with love. This one was just made dumping stuff in, and then okay, here this is what came out. It's the same recipe, but was it made with love? You know, what is the difference between just having someone in the house with you versus having a wife in the house with you. One who does things from the heart. Where do we find beauty? And that's something like we can ask both men and women. Where is the beauty at? Is it just in the face? Is it just in the outward appearance? Or is it through the actions? Is it through the heart? Do we notice those things in our spouse before they're our spouse and while they're our spouse? The outward appearance changes. Hopefully the inward appearance continues to be enhanced as we follow God's word. But as we look at it, adorn with a gentle and quiet spirit. Being able to have the effects of the spirit following God is that of peace, the gentleness. It is not at war or turmoil. It is focused and shows love appropriately. Where do we show that love? How do we show the love? And quite simply, it's in everything we do. Peter reiterates that these few points right here in this manner, in the former times, holy women who trusted in God and adorned themselves being submissive to their own husbands, as Sarah obeyed Abraham, calling him Lord, whose daughters you are if you do good and are not afraid with any terror. The promise of Abraham is being reiterated here. The promise that all, that through him, all the nations will be blessed. Do we follow the examples of the women as well? It's not just the seed of Abraham. He couldn't have a child on his own. He had to have a faithful wife with him. It came from both Abraham and Sarah for us to have this promise today. The godly wife. But what do you deserve? That are, those are the characteristics and qualities of a godly wife that Peter gives us at this point here. It spreads that out over a couple of verses. The rest of this goes to uh, wives. What should you be receiving from your husbands? Peter gives us one verse right here. Guys, he makes it simple on us. He gives us one verse to pay attention to about this part right here. But in this one verse, he gives several points. Verse 7 of chapter 3 says, Husbands, likewise, dwell with them with understanding, giving honor to the wife as to the weaker vessel, being heirs together of the grace of life, that your prayers may not be A real short, quick verse, one sentence, but how much is in here? Digging into it here, wives, what should you expect from your husbands? Your husbands will dwell with you. Which means that wives, even you are being told to be chased up above, we are being told to be chased as well. Stay with your wife. Let your desires be for your wife. Let your focus be at home. How much of the world is in trouble because we don't keep our eyes inside the house? We don't keep our eyes on our spouses. You know, there's too many people, too many fights, too many arguments, too many craziness going on because we don't focus ourselves says here, just focus. Dwell with them with understanding. Who knows your wife best? Who knows them the best? When we got married, we left mother and father to be with our spouses. Does the spouse know the other one the best? This comes with dangers and with benefits. 
First off, we know which buttons to push to rile up or to calm down. Question is, which do we do? If we know what button to push to rile up, do we continually push them? That's probably not the best idea, and that is not what is being given here. We should know our spouse, husbands. We need to know our wives. We have to understand them. We have to be able to see when they're not having a good day and when to maybe give them a little bit of space. When to do something nice, which should be all the time, but that extra little something. When to take and step in to help. He says we are to give honor to the wife. Respect the woman and her virtues. We just covered the virtues of a, a godly wife, having a heart of a servant, being chaste, the appropriate adornment. And we should do this without exhorting her or showing her off. Start thinking about it. Look back. If you want to uh, review this one, look at Esther chapter 1. How did Esther become queen? Well, it was because someone else was queen and she did not allow her drunken husband to show her off during a massive, during a, no, a feast, after a feast, and he was drunk and with all of his buddies said, hey, you all ought to check out my wife. Hey, come here, wife. And she said no. As the queen went, when the king says, come, you come, she put herself at great risk because he did not honor her. We should not put our wives in such a place. We should honor and respect her enough not to do that. He makes mention here to honor the wife as to the weaker vessel. As a standard, the woman's body is built differently than a man's. Now, and as we look at Mother's Day, you know, I do not believe that women are weak. You put an eight-pound bowling ball out of your body to give birth to a child, that does not show weakness. That shows great strength, but we have differences of strength. We have differences of body structure and body functions. Allow each gender to do their own thing, and that's how I'm going to say it for this particular thing. There's a reason in sports today that we have a men's division and a women's division. All this garbage that everyone is throwing out that is not biblical. I think we need to go back and look at what the Bible says. Just because someone's a woman does not mean they're not being respected because it says give honor to them. We each do our own things. We each have our own tasks, our own things to do. So let us build each other up. Fill in those voids. Help complement one another. And we do all of this because we are heirs together in the grace of life. We are all allowed to have this life and to live and to be part of it. I'll say as a husband now, it is nice to have a wife. It is nice to have someone with me to go through this life with. To share in the things that are there. To be able to go forward. Being heirs together means that we are having something to give one another. If you are an heir to something, you, are, you will receive an inheritance. Thinking about this little phrase, I put it another way, is that a husband and a wife inherit the time and experience of life with one another. Use this time to increase the bonds with one another to help each other gain the heavenly inheritance. And we each must work out our own salvation, but we can help each other along the process. All of these things we must do to our wives, husbands, so that our prayers may not be hindered. If we do not take care of our wives, if we do not honor them and respect them, we are going against what God wants us to do. 
what God has told us because right here, if we don't do these things, then obviously our prayers can be in vain. Which means we have an issue. Love your neighbor as thyself. You know, Christ is the second greatest commandment. Who is a closer neighbor than our spouse? A godly woman is a very rare thing nowadays, it seems like. But it's a very precious thing and should be honored, respected, cherished. Husbands, do that to your wives. Peter specifically used Abraham and Sarah as an example. As mentioned before, we could use any number of examples that were counted as righteous. That could be counted as a good example to what we have for looking to, to understand and to apply in our lives today. As Jerry mentioned in his prayer uh, for Mary, the mother of Jesus, how special a task must that have been to have known what the, you know, what she was doing? But we could go back and look at that on any woman that is highlighted in the scriptures. We have so many to look at, so many examples, so many role models. Do we look at those? Do we respect them? Do we give them honor? And not just one day a year. I think Charles mentioned that this morning. It should be every day. Respect one another. Today we focus on mothers. We think about that idea. We think about the, the impact that they are in our lives. That also means we men, we have a responsibility to them as well. So we thank them for it. We do all these great things. But how are we in all that we do. The focus towards each other and how we're supposed to be shows a glimpse into our soul. It shows us who we are truly. Do we respect them? Are we respectful? Are we as Peter encourages us to be? In 3 and verse 8, he wraps this little segment up and says, finally, all of you be of one mind, having compassion for one another, Love as brothers, be tender-hearted, be courteous. He goes on about not repaying evil for evil and other things there, but be of one mind. Focus ourselves to the service of God in everything that we do. As mothers, as wives, as husbands, as children, as servants, in all aspects of life, serve God appropriately. As we look at the invitation for today, as we wrap up and get ready to sing our song of invitation, are there any needs of the congregation, of anyone that is present? If we have the need to focus ourselves, as Peter says, into these tasks that he has given us, let's focus ourselves. If we need to come back to those tasks, if we need help along the pathway, if we need help in any other way, the invitation is open for all while we together stand.